many times people who undertake projects in this country they do it and view it as a cash cow so from the costing to the implementation to the quality of work everything is compromised because guys must work there when they are billionaires at the end of a project even assessing authorities everybody assessing certification this job has been done well people are lining up to get their cut then you end up with <laughs> grossly over, over, over costed projects and huge public debt poorly done this country is at the level of development where each one of us must have a whistle when you see something wrong blow the whistle the media don't hide things and mm -hmm. add things how come up to now nobody has been able to force government to table the SGR contract with all this media and all these people in this country any geos Civil society. Civil society. Why? How? The whistle is what will save this country. Projects, mm -hmm. and the roads in particular, are cash cows. So the, the Kenha, Kera, anybody who is there becomes rich within a year. Let them, let them come and argue with me here. You can be sued, you know? Let them come. I'm, I'm more than welcome. Let you come, I ask you, before you became director of this body, who are you? Where were you living? Where do you live now? Where are your children going to school? Rubbish. All these are cash cows. And we must bring an end to this. I keep saying, we will have to bring an end to this. Otherwise, this country will collapse. One of the most ambitious infrastructural goals set by President Uhuru's administration is the upscaling of road infrastructure in the country. Now, with regards to delivering on this particular promise or rather agenda, how well have they fared on? And besides, what stumbling, stumbling blocks have come in the way of executing that very same mandate that they committed themselves towards uh, taking in this country? My name is Richard Mwenja, your resident host here on Business Glide. Truly, truly honored that you've joined us on yet another edition of this very show, a show that we hope will have an impact on the future of Kenya's economy. But now to help me dissect into this conversation is none other than renowned political analyst and public scholar, Haman Bond Manyora. Great to see you, sir. Thank you. However, you are putting on a long face today and you seem low on energy. Are you yeah, slightly under the weather? Uh, slightly under the weather, yes. All right. We yes, hope yes, things yes. will be good for you. Oh, of course, of course. Nice. You are a hopeful man. Oh, yes. I'm and a man every of Kenyan God. should be. A man of God. Faith in God all the time. I see. Yes. Uh, way back in 2013, when Uhuru's administration uh, clinched powers, they committed themselves to develop road infrastructure in this country. They set a target of delivering road uh, network that stretches over 10,000 10, kilometers by the end of the second term. This far, they have actually surpassed that target. Their aim is to get at 11,000 kilometers before the exit of his come August uh, 9th. Now, would you say that the current feel among Kenyans that yes, we do not eat roads, and also that perhaps it time road infrastructure takes a backseat and pro probably focus on other development uh, avenues? Do you feel that that's the conversation you need to have as a country as at now? And what kind of thinking should be pumped into the minds of Kenyans that uh, road networks are as important as any other development agenda we can undertake as a as a government? I know many people are saying we don't eat roads. Mm -hmm. They are saying they, they, they need food on the table and they are right. But you equally need roads because uh, food is needed today. It will also be needed tomorrow. The roads are to ensure there is food tomorrow also. So I think the conversation should not be whether or not we need roads or whether or not we must eat and at the expense of roads. No. We need roads. We need food. Uh, this is a question of balance. Yeah. I see. All right, there have been concerns over the kind of public-private partnerships we as a country are, are getting involved in. If you look at the case of the express uh, way that is, uh, that is uh, yet to be co co commissioned very soon, and also if you look at other projects such as the, uh, the SGR, Standard Gauge Railway, a number of uh, questions have been raised with regards to the budget and whether they are, are sustainable enough with regards to our repayment of our debt that we secured to facilitate the development of such infrastructure. As a country, is it high time that we rethink our public-private partnerships and we ensure we get into those that we can sustain them and they have an impact uh, to a larger number of Kenyans at the end of the day? I think PPP is the public-private uh, uh, partnerships. Private, uh, partnerships. I think the one that is uh, 
of immediate relevance is the uh, expressway. SGR is a, is a, is a Kenya government uh, project, of course with external yeah. debt and so on and so forth. You see, the public uh, is, uh, the government is, is the biggest uh, provider of business anywhere in the world. Unfortunately, since the people who act on behalf of government in a public, uh, private, public, private partnership are not government itself, so they don't feel the pinch. If they were entering in a partnership with another developer, say you have your piece of land, you are on, and you are coming in a partnership with a person who has money to develop, say put up so much in terms of high-rise buildings, you will be sure your deal will be good in that. You won't, you won't allow a road deal? No. You will strike a hard bargain because it's your property. But it's unfortunate those who strike the deal on behalf of government are not government. They don't feel the pinch. So in many instances across the world, governments get a road deal. Because the negotiators are persons with their own interests. So when you look at anywhere there is a PPP, you will find that... Uh, the government doesn't get the best deal. All right. Or a government institution, maybe a university. Let's say a university has land. They're looking for a developer to develop under PPP. So the person who is acting on behalf of the university is not, the, is not government. It doesn't feel, he doesn't have the feeling. So long as he gets something out of it. So the, you'll find that uh, we always get a road deal in this kind of arrangements. Okay. Yeah. In as much as we are getting a road deal, would you say that perhaps even as we go into the path of looking at public-private partnerships, that we should only go for those that have a, an impact on a wider number of Kenyans? So uh, look like the expressway, it will benefit majority of Kenyans who are around the Nairobi city. But perhaps we look at projects that have an impact to over, say, a million Kenyans so that we look at uh, eradicating poverty and so forth, like the dam projects and so forth. You know, mm -hmm. what you are saying is, 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 is quite okay. It's not just one project. It is, it is any project for that matter. You look at its immediate benefits, long-term benefits, you look at its cost, you look at uh, location, where, where are you likely to, to locate a project for maximum impact on the citizen of the country? So you, there are so many factors to be considered. Unfortunately, like I've said, many times people who undertake projects in this country, they do it and view it as a cash cow. So from the costing, to the implementation, to the quality of work, everything is compromised because guys must work there when they are billionaires. At the end of a project... Even assessing authorities. Everybody assessing certification, this job has been done well. People are lining up to get their cut. Then you end up with <laughs> grossly over-costed over, over projects. And huge public debt. Poorly done, you know? and. And then a huge public debt. All right. Those are, those are things you need to look at. The new administration coming in like in August, September, they must begin to do things differently. Absolutely. Yeah. So our people are as poor as it can get. And uh, I'm saying so because concerns have been raised with regards to matters to do with the regional balanced regional development. When road infrastructure... Uh, where it's taken is uh, largely influenced by the political side you as a legislator you are leaning on so that you can get uh, the favor of the national governments with regards to if they can bring that development uh, priority to your area and so forth. How much of a worry is this to a country that is seeking to develop and, uh, and perhaps achieve heights its development partners, say Singapore, China and so forth have achieved, where now you as an MP, you are leaning will particularly much decide what kind of infrastructure project to get, particularly the roads. You know, even even just where should you do a road, even a village road, how can it be left to an MP or a MCA? They are not experts. We must have some central planning. This is where we go wrong, even with the devolution. A governor is not an engineer, he's not an expert in that line. You need central planning so that the implementation first, the supervision, monitoring and evaluation, that is when you rope in the local agencies. MCA, MP, governor, and all the county yeah. arrangement, so that they ensure that this project that has been allocated to our county, we are not getting a road deal because the people who are supposed to do it, do it the way it's supposed to be done. That's how you come in. If you must contribute to other resources, you contribute some of the resources. 
But you cannot be the ones deciding what role to be done, how it should be done, but you are not experts. Kenyans who've taken social media and complained about the Mount Kenya roads boom, whereby we see the Mau Mau road under construction yeah. traversing four counties. They are saying uh, Mount Kenya leaders have taken road infrastructure projects to their areas just to win the political favor of the electorate and so forth. These uh, Western leaders decry in such and uh, leaders from North Rift and so forth. Are they justified to complain over such? We are justified because this is our country. We must uh, have uh, equity and equality in terms of distribution of resources, roads included. We cannot allow unfair distribution of, of, of resources of this country uh, that includes roads. But again, we must be aware that we do not have a well-structured approach to these things. Secondly, we also need to be aware that the kind of people we elect, right from MCA to president, will determine this noise we are making. We have an, an opportunity to make that choice in a couple of weeks from now. We will put in place a person who will perpetuate the same or bring an end to this. So that there's equitable and equ uh, equitable sharing of resources in the country, including roads. All the time we must also remember, Richard, that uh, politics is about getting power to determine who gets what, how much of it and where and, you know, and when. And when. Yeah. That, that's the reality of politics. That those who get into office also have their own priorities. They want power. Even in, develop, in the de yes, democracies? Yes, yes. It's happening. Trump, Trump's priority was the Great Wall, the Trump Wall. It required huge resources at the expense of other things, you know. When you do one thing, you are doing it at the expense of another thing. You, you know, a foregone opportunity, they're elsewhere. Opportunity cost. And therefore, we also not just not need, 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 we also not just have to make noise about an equitable share of resources. Of resources. No, we contribute to that by the kind of people we put in office. Put men and women in the national assembly who will ensure resources are distributed fairly within the country. The 9th August is the game changer. Look at the presidential candidates. I hear there are over forty of them. Isolate a man or a woman you feel will put an end to this unfair, skewed development of the country. Well noted, sir. Yeah. We have the Kenya National Highways Authority, we have Kenya Urban Roads Authority, as well as the Kenya Rural Roads Authority. These three agencies are really working towards ensuring that as much as we are going to road uh, development, uh, they are of high quality under the budgets that are, that are sustainable and also its maintenance and rehabilitation is done in due course. But then why do we have cases of inflated road projects if we have all these oversight agencies in place? We have our legislators who we expect them to act in the best interest of the electorate and so forth. As a country, is it time that we should be still struggling with the case of road contractors and particularly why road projects of them all? Is that the perfect cash cow for our legislators and people who, uh, who just want to, uh, to cap, uh, gobble up taxpayers' money? Projects mm -hmm. and the roads in particular are cash cows. So the, the Kenha, Kera, anybody who is there becomes rich within a year. Let them, let them come and argue with me here. You can be sued, you know? Let them come. I'm, I'm more than welcome. Let you come, I ask you, before you became director of this body, who are you? Where were you living? Where do you live now? Where are your children going to school? Rubbish. All these are cash cows. And we must bring an end to this. I keep saying, we will have to bring an end to this. Otherwise, this country will collapse. And on the side of Kenyans, who are these very same contractors that are awarded such tenders and so forth, what could be your message to them? You're a public scholar and you have the best interest of the country at heart. To this very Kenyan, who is like you and I, not in the contracting world and all, what's your message to them? I've said the, the people must always carry a whistle with them. This country is at the level of development where each one of us must have a whistle. When you see something wrong, blow the whistle. The media. Don't hide things and add things. How come up to now nobody has been able to force government to table the SGR contract with all this media and all these people in this country, NGOs, civil society? Civil society. Why? How? The whistle is what will save this country. Everybody, everyone of us must carry a whistle. You are in the media, you are a student, you are a whatever you are. When you see something going on wrong, when you see, I saw in my village, we were doing a road, it was passing through my village town center, let's call it a center, Jebrok. 
Do you know Chinese who are sweeping the roads? Casuals? Yes. And people are just there, they are celebrating it. Or China. Many Chinese were bro. <laughs> and you know that stage where you must clean the road for the tarmac or the tar? Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Chinese! That one even... They tried it? something like that in Kericho. I remember. And Franklin Beto was the minister for roads. They keep saying, say, you will only employ a foreigner to drive this caterpillar yes. once none of our children can do it. That's the only condition. The bare minimum. Gong Road here. I saw foreigners driving these small things. things. Here I saw it. Anybody can come and challenge That Bilal can operate or yes. person. I think they are Lebanese. We can't allow those kind of things. Kenyans must carry a whistle with them. A road is passing your place. Somebody is doing a, a bridge. He's using a, a metal D6, D8 instead of D60. And everybody is saying it will collapse. And nobody's bothered. It actually collapsed in Kajiado, 100 and million. They Kenyans must know the future of this country is in their hands. The whistle is what will save this country. I see. And especially institutions that have the muscle, the way, the way we do, like media, they must help this country. Let's advance that conversation. Are you signaling that as a country it's time we look at uh, whistleblowing policies and mechanisms that can facilitate whistleblowers to come up? Should, they, should, they, should there be a person who is patriot with the country at Kenha, at Kura, yeah. or at Kera and so forth, and all these agencies that are, are leaning on the, on the development of the road research in the country? Should they now look at a regulate, regulatory framework that guides whistleblowing mechanisms in them? Yes, let me give you a story. <laughs> there is a, a cement factor in this country. Let me not men mention it. But I think government has shares there. It collapsed. Workers had issues with salaries and everything. It had huge tracts of land. The only option was now to sell part of this land. Thousands of acres and so on. So many bad things were happening. So I was chatting with a few guys who work there. We met in a restaurant around there. I told them, this cement factory has collapsed because of you. Say, how? Not us in Wakubwa. Wakubwa, how? You work on the way bridge. No cement can pass there without passing the way bridge. You get the documents. You look at the document, you can see this cement, somebody has paid for 50 bucks. But this thing is carrying 250 bucks. And being allowed to pass. Because you are told, inaendea mkubwa fulani kujengea nyumba. That's how your company has collapsed. So Kenyans must know they have the power within their hands. You look at a school. I've, I've given this example many times. You go to a school, a good school. There are 40 teachers in a big school, 40 or 50 teachers, qualified, degrees, masters, even PhDs. These days you find on high schools. One man, the principal, can mess the school until it goes down completely. These 40 teachers are just watching. Iron fist governance. In fact, when the principal drives in the compound, everything, everybody freezes. That culture of fear and subservience. I wrote in a, in, in, in a small book, I wrote why things won't work in Kenya. Unless you deal with that culture of fear and subservience, how grown-up men with degrees are trembling because the principal is entering the gate. Unless you deal with that, this country will never move forward. All right. Yeah. In as much as we as taxpayers are looking forward to get value for our money that has been channeled towards road infrastructure, you'll agree with me that there are agencies that come on board that will ensure that also the safety of roads uh, is secured and also in terms of how best we use these roads to ensure that their quality is sustained. And this, I'm talking about officials at our various way bridges along major highways and so forth. I'm talking about institutions such as the National Transport Safety Authority, NTSA and so forth. But however, the integrity is, of, uh, is kind of worrying and so forth. We are looking at cases of bribery and so forth. In the fullness of time, what danger? does their lack of integrity pose to this country it in terms of tax, tax evasion and so forth? The country will collapse. This country is headed to collapse. A country is just a, a concern. A country is just like a company. It's just like an organization. If you don't put the right measures in place, the organization will collapse. This country is going to collapse. And it's not going to be the first country to collapse. This country is going to collapse. The it's not going to be the first country to collapse. Or there are those you think are standing but they are the walking dead. You think somebody is alive, but he's a walking dead person. He's a dead person just walking. That's where we're headed. So those institutions you, you cite, they are just useless. 
They don't do anything. They can't monitor. But in their officers, we took to Ganjo Police Training School to no, be taught on ethics and so forth. There is something fundamental that must be done. That's why I laugh at Ruto's bottom up and all this. It's rubbish. You must check the hemorrhage. You must convince me you'll stop stealing. That institution charged with oversight will do their work. That those people who are put somewhere to oversight on behalf of public, you allow a shoddy deal and you put your signature there. You'll go to jail for 50 years. Let your father call you the day you are given an appointment in KRA and be my son sit down here. We love you. We want to continue seeing you. Go and do your work well. Don't be like so-and-so's son. He's doing 30 years in jail. We want to get there. We want your wife, your husband, your father, your mother to tell you, I know where you are going to work, there's a lot of temptation. But we are in a country where if you work there six months without buying a car, they'll think you are foolish. You've said KRA, ESCC and such yeah. agencies. Yeah. So we must get there. We have no option. Right. We have to get at a point where values are in place, integrity is important, impunity is laid, corruption is a thing of the past. Before we get there, any talk of developing this country is a waste of time. All right. Yes. The very last, uh, politics of the economy have awashed our, our, press, our, our media presence here in Kenya and also the normal environment that we are residing in. And if you look at Raila Odinga's case, he's AU special envoy for infrastructure. He has in the past served as the Minister of Roads. They both have, uh, have promised Kenya that they'll deliver not just roads, but better roads and really major roads that will turn around, open up local economies and make sure that people from the interior can access the same facilities as those in major urban centers and so forth. Would you say that Railo Odinga is better placed to deliver on this very particular goal of in upscaling and ramping up Kenya's uh, road network? In the on the face of it, yes, he's an engineer. Mm -hmm. uh, he was Minister of Roads and we saw what he did. Uh, he has always campaigned on infrastructure number one, infrastructure number two, infrastructure number three. He's AU special envoy on infrastructure. So when you look at that, you, you'll, you, you, you'll, you'll have to conclude that he's best placed. But reality may, may be different. <laughs> <laughs> Given the job, he may just continue business as usual. All right. Because he's also just sur surrounded by these Ngorokos. He's a good man surrounded yeah. by evil men. Yeah, all these people want to eat. All, right. all the people want to be ministers. They don't want to be ministers to help you deliver on your promise. They want to be ministers to eat. But you want to be a minister, you say that. You can't get me. You can't get someone like me. They can't have me in cabinet. cabinet because heads, nothing will pass there without me challenging. They cannot have me in cabinet. I see. I'll tell them off some of these stupid things. That are, this, this is not good for this country. They need to get manuras of this country. If you have five ministers like me, the country will change. Well, that point by Herman Manura takes us to the wrap of this conversation today, touching on matters road infrastructure in the country and whether Uhuru's uh, government has done well enough with regards to executing that particular promise they made to Kenyans uh, when they ascended into power back in 2013. For fun of the week, we go all the way to Kapkoi Saisol, a young lady by the name of Mary Njogu. Mary Njogu from Kapkoi, thank you for being part of this family. We, we really thank you very much. All right, keep this conversation going beyond here. I'm at Mwenja Richard on Twitter at Hmanyora as well. Make sure you watch our subsequent editions of Business Glide. As I said earlier on, it is a show that we hope will have a, an impact on the future of Kenya's economy. Up next on your screen is the Business Glide African Proverb of the Day. <laughs>